Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Mastering Dungeons. I am your host, Sean Merwin, along with my intrepid companion, my chwinga, Teo nice. Sabadilla. Yeah. Oh, man, that's like gaining a level to hear you call me a chwinga. Yeah. You elemental should sprite be... is my final form. Exactly. I wish. I wish <laughs> I could be an elemental sprite. Those words, that they sound so nice. Elemental sprite. Sprite. Right. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed more to more of an elemental seven up, but I was like, dirty troglodyte is about <laughs> the level I'm at at this point. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know, you can still shower during the pandemic. Okay, you 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 could. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, I heard you couldn't. I haven't showered in a week, uh, week uh, a week in yeah. two years. Math is hard, <laughs> yes, oh, two years. Good. Wow, <laughs> yep, you know, the pandemic hasn't been for that long. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I, I've lost track of all time and Welcome good sense. Welcome to the hygiene podcast. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of hygiene, you mm. went to a convention this weekend that you didn't actually go to, but you just attended virtually, and that was Winter Fantasy. You know, it was great. I uh, I received a shipment of minis, coincidentally, so it was like I stopped at the dealer's hall. Okay. Uh, I went to the bathrooms, and it was like the cleanest bathrooms ever at a con. Because it nice. was my bathroom. Yeah. Yep. Cheap food. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Cheap yeah. food. Cheap food and uh, drink. I that, even got that's... delivery once for my wife. That was super nice of her. Thank that's you. wow. Shout out. Uh, and so, no, yeah. So what did you fantasy, do there? I played a trilogy of Moonshay, the, the 13 series. Uh, this is the 13th trilogy released. Uh, super fun. Um, mm. I've been talking about it online because it was interesting. I mean, this is where you get into, you know, tier three play. But... Um, it is uh, really, there were really good stories, really engaging, fun stuff. But I play a barbarian with an AC of 13. Mm -hmm. And the worst I had was a third of my hit points remaining. And that was with me just being in the middle of everything, you know, just doing what you'd imagine a barbarian in a movie would do. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe I wasn't taking more damage. And I was, I was by far the most hurt in my party. So it was just interesting. It made me think a lot about 5e and counter construction, because I know that these adventures, you know, I, with, I can't help but apply my designer brain. I know you do this too. Right. And when I'm playing these things, I think to myself, this is supposed to be a way over deadly encounter. And it isn't. And I'm not sure it ever is. And I was talking to another really good DM and Graham was saying that, uh, you know, they applied multiples of difficulty to these encounters. And so it's, it's just interesting how 5e is, it's hard at those high levels, right? I mean, and I think right. all editions struggle with this, but yeah. Yeah. At, at lower levels, if you, if you use the chart, you know, at first level, second level, third level, tier one, maybe even the start of tier two, you get deadly encounters and they do feel deadly. But once you get a tier three, even high tier two, tier three, tier four, those, charts that the dungeon master's yeah. guide uses go right out the window but i feel like and you know this is maybe something we can talk about a different time in more detail but i think it's it's almost like like it's just straight up math of hit points versus damage output by monsters i mean we were not counterspelling i mean we counterspelled like one thing once but a lot of times people just weren't in range and so we, we couldn't counterspell we weren't countering we weren't hypnotic pattering we you know it wasn't there was yeah. none of that sort of shenanigans it was just straight up the damage inflicted could not exceed our hit points kind of thing. And right. it was very interesting for me as a designer to take it in. But the bigger thing was Winter Fantasy Convention was a success, even if online. Last year, you and I and many others were there in person. Mm -hmm. DMs are great. Uh, the DM I had was uh, their first time ever DMing for Baldman, but they were they were super pros on um, on Roll20. They were, they were just, you know, had all kinds of cool macros that, did things and highlighted stuff and super and they knew the modules you know backwards and forwards so and the moonshade isles adventures are excellent you get this beautiful art for each npc so just everything was wonderful about it nice. and other than not being there in person <laughs> yeah yeah i mean eric mengi who is in charge of those adventures and has a team that is incredible the story is is uh great this the moonshade isles story um if you want a campaign levels one to 20 that has everything you need to run it and is fun and is engaging and has great story through the entire thing check out those Munche isle uh adventures yeah on the dm it's skill. true I, I love eric's work and and you start we're part of the team initially 
um, Moonshay Isles, the the Ebron campaign. Those are both just you can't miss at those. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, uh, some more news dropped that had both Teos and I going, uh, hmm. Mm. And that uh, news was Adam Bradford, who was the co-founder, I believe, of D&D Beyond, as well yeah. as Lauren Urban and Todd Kendrick, all departed D&D Beyond this past weekend. Now, they said, each separately said that while they can't talk about it yet, they are going to share soon the new opportunities that they have left D&D Beyond to pursue. And we are literally pressing refresh on Twitter, hoping that this news will drop to where they're going, not just because we care about them, because uh, you know all three of them are great people. They've worked really hard to make D&D Beyond more than just a simple desktop tool for D&D, uh, right? They've created content. They've They've served the needs of the fans and of the players in, in incredible ways. And so when you see three of the most public facing members of the team leave, it gives you pause. Not to mention that James Hake, who was also a member of that team, uh, left a few weeks prior, leaves us wondering what's going on with D&D Beyond. I own all my books on D&D Beyond. I use D&D Beyond every day, multiple. I have like yeah. 12 D&D Beyond tabs open right now for, for, for the work I do. Uh, yeah. So I am, I am holding my breath to see what's going on with D&D Beyond. It hits you on all the levels, right? And, and, and maybe by the time this podcast comes out, and if, and if we don't at some point hit refresh and learn the news, um, and I think even if we learn some things, it'll be months and maybe even years before we fully learn all of it, because that's the way things go in this industry. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you know, you have to stop and, and, and think that this is significant in some way, right? Because D and D Beyond has had a magic to it that few auxiliary companies that revolve around D and D or feed off of plug into D and D have had. Mm -hmm. In general, online tabletop tool rule solutions have failed and, and usually failed quite <laughs> enormously. Yeah. You know, they've, they've fallen short on so many levels. And this is one where the tool works mm -hmm. and then exceeds your expectations. And it's yeah. done so for some time. And the way that Adam Bradford steered that ship of development, being able to both speak to what was being done as a VP, as a developer, um, as someone with with uh, you know a mind that sees where the product should go, uh, and being able to communicate with the with with the community to create community out of saying here's what's basically release notes right to to right. give it a human angle and talk about iced tea and talk about sorry sweetened iced tea, mm -hmm. um, my, my bad Adam yeah <laughs> uh, you know and and then Lauren who who touches so many things uh, at so many levels through D and D. Mm -hmm. Um, and Todd, who is behind this, the filming of so many great parts of D and D James with everything he did to write incredible pieces. I mean, this is, it, it's, it's a whole package that was created and these people are, are not, you know, some random part of that equation. They're, they are the equation or they're the equation we know. Right. Right. They're, they're the public facing, uh, you know, important, yeah. you know, they're, they're behind D and D beyond are obviously a bunch of great pro software designers. Uh, and so that's not to say that they're not still there and still working. Uh, and their roles are important, obviously. It's just that this is, these are the people we knew. These are the public faces. Yeah. And so it's scary to see so much change in that way. Okay. Right? If, yeah, if, if it had been, you know, three of the software developers left, that would still be scary for me, but it'd be scary in a different way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, there have been a lot of announcements of different um, virtual tabletops that are coming out and things like that. So th there's all mm -hmm. kinds of speculation one can do. But at the end of it, it I, I just, I focus on the fact that you have to wonder what this means for D&D Beyond, mm -hmm. why this all happened, so many people at once, um, and where they'll go, because all of that will be, I think, an interesting impact on our industry. Yep, for sure. Hmm. From the industry news to a blog that Teos and I both really love, it's DM David. 
And this time he talked about NPCs that won't cooperate. And I've I've actually talked to him about this, I think, before in person, and uh, he has some very good points. Uh, what he talks about here is that many times when we're running uh, D&D or playing D&D, we come across an NPC that you try to engage with, and the NPC is totally unhelpful. Um, unhelpful in terms of moving the story along, unhelpful in terms of even having a fun role-playing encounter with sometimes. So what DM David uh, says is let's look at NPCs like a puzzle that the players are trying to solve. And so it doesn't have to be solely about making checks, but it's about trying to figure out what motivates an NPC, what they can give you, and why they may not want to give you that information. So rather than just being a block, they are uh, a puzzle. And the way I like to think about this, this is one thing that came up when people were talking about skill challenges from fourth edition, uh, skill challenges that ha were a good idea, but weren't exactly explained or designed well. And if you think of an NPC as sort of a mini skill challenge, you as the DM or you as the content creator who's created that NPC can ferret out and actually put down on paper whether it's in a diagram form or a bullet list, what they know and what has to happen on the side of the players to get that information out of them. Um, and though that's what a skill challenge setup can really do is give you that blueprint for how to run it and the motivations for those NPCs. Yeah, and I really liked how he, he looks at the idea that an NPC can have a reason why they're reticent to share information, but that reason is something that the PCs can puzzle out and overcome. And that's the story and that's the fun of it. And I thought about this article as I was playing through an encounter this weekend where I think there just was only so much we're allowed to learn at this encounter stage. So it didn't matter what we said to them, what we did we couldn't progress, but we weren't getting motivation, right? If we knew like she is too afraid to tell you what's going on at this time, mm -hmm. but she might later, or, uh, you know, there's some outside pressure, right? And, and what I like is in this article, DM David gives you a table of reasons why the person might not uh, help you initially. And, and those are things that one can do something about, right? So it's want something, a bribe, an errand done, or to be convinced that they stand to gain if the players succeed. Mm -hmm. They were paid to keep silent or to stay out. Uh, the players have unwittingly caused the NPC to suffer a loss, right? And a whole bunch of other ones. And those are things that, you know, just thinking those, I was like, oh yeah, right? Like that makes, right. if you tell, if the PCs, if the players uncover this information, they, they get it too. And they know, all right, that's why I'm having some trouble, but you know, now I can work with that. And, and that's the stuff that makes encounters, social encounters, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And it also helps you as the DM figure out how to role play that, that yeah. NPC as well. So it, it, it scratches the itch both on the mechanical side of how do we get this information and on the narrative side of what does this NPC bring to the story? Yeah. So look for that uh, under dmdavid.com. And another blogster, uh, also, you know, the creative rubber on Keith Baker, uh, has his blog on creating campaigns. You want to take this one, Teos? Yeah. Uh, Keith Baker, who is the creator of Everon, creator of so many different games, Phoenix Dawn Command, uh, he maintains a blog and might be monthly, weekly, I don't even know, but it, but often we'll post the, at a regular interval, where we'll post blogs about Eberron and look at different aspects of the setting. We mentioned a few months ago or a few episodes ago that he has created a Patreon where he runs a campaign that the Patreon subscribers help design. And so he's now going back and sharing campaign creation information. And this is a really neat blog post that covers a number of, of aspects of campaign creation focused on characters. Um, and he starts with the idea that player characters are remarkable. They're like the characters in a movie who are not just normal. They are special. They're powerful. The word look, the world looks to them and reacts to them. Um, and these types of 
characters typically in movies in novels are characters that are dedicated to the cause and so sort of they, they act in a certain way and he gives the example of james bond who doesn't use his power to take over england he's loyal to it he doesn't want that power or wealth and in similar ways player characters aren't trying to take over the kingdom usually they're serving it right mm -hmm. and they want to see good done um and so because you know that players are acting this way that allows you to create certain types of campaigns and feed off of that mm -hmm. um, where the players are the most powerful the characters the most powerful people in the room or in the kingdom but they still serve a cause um, and then he talks about campaign design as if you're a writer of a tv show and how to build the type of campaign that the stars of that story that show would want to play mm -hmm. and then you design uh, adaptive design to what those players would do. It's really, there's a lot of in here and, and highly recommend it on keith-baker.com. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because when you build a world and present it to your player base, generally you get two responses that are sort of diametr diametrically opposed. The first is all the NPCs are low level or, or non-leveled, right? The king is a third level whatever right and and players complain well if he's only third level then as soon as my character's fifth level how come i'm not ruling the world <laughs> right but if you do a, a the same world and you put in 20th level characters in all these npc positions what do they say then why do we even need to be there <laughs> they could just handle their own problems because and so divesting that idea that level equals power is something that either comes with sort of wisdom, I guess, or time where you can come to that understanding. Yeah, and, and I think D&D always has some some pieces that one must ignore, right? Like the, uh, the magic has not vastly changed us away from medieval fantasy. Right. We just must accept that, right? That somehow outside of very narrow things that exist in worlds like Eberron, you know, with some flying ships and other conveniences like that, we don't, the economy does not completely change or anything. And it's the same way with powerful characters. One, right. one does not need them in positions of power. And in fact, the way the world works in a D&D RPG fantasy is generally that that is not the prerequisite for rulership, right? It's, it's other things that matter still. And that's, that's a nice aspect of the world. I like that. Yeah. Under the Seas of Vidari, a Kickstarter that follows uh, the Seas of Vidari Kickstarter. It's adding resources for areas below the waves, uh, supporting GMs running underwater adventures with new player options, NPCs, hazards, undersea monsters and mounts and gear, um, adventures and more. So who uh, worked on this? Yeah, it's the team from uh, tribality.com that's running it. Um, so if you're familiar with that website, and you should be, it has a, a ton of really good blogs, excellent content. And those folks uh, often appear on podcasts, and they publish a number of creations. And they did this Seas of Adari Kickstarter a while back. Uh, and now those members plus other accomplished designers and artists are working on this piece. It really, they, the previous Kickstarter did a great job of covering things like being on ships and traveling between islands and how to make that interesting and captivating. And so now they look under the surface of the waves. Um, it's already funded. It's on until March 5th, and I'm sure this will be great. It's also a wonderful way to back the creations of a team that's often giving so much Mm -hmm. uh, through blogs online, nice way to pay them back. So do check it out. You have until March 5th for that. Yeah. And, uh, goes along well, I would guess with the, uh, ghosts of salt marsh. Yeah, absolutely. Book. Yep. Sweet. So with that, we turn to a little survey that Teos did. We want your feedback. Yeah. We like being, you know, uh, analysts and t kicking apart taking apart and, and digesting all the little pieces of rhyme but it's nice to take a step back and see what do people think that aren't us mm -hmm. and uh it's been really neat to see that the initial responses to this survey have been great uh, we've had a number of them from and we're, we're looking for dms that have run at least some of rhyme and three or more other 
uh, hardback adventures that D&D has published so that they can do that sort of comparative analysis and we can see how, how they like it. So I look forward to sharing. We, we've shared the link on Twitter. It's one of those enormous Google, got, Google Doc links. Uh, so not one I can easily say, but if you look at, at our Twitter accounts, you can find us retweeting it. Um, and so we'll use this in a future episode to look at, at, you know, not just our analysis, but what others have said. Yep. It'll also be in the show notes this week. So if yeah. you get it from misdirectedmark.com, you can go there to this episode and the link will be there. And when, when we come to our final show, uh, on Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, we will share some of these uh, thoughts that people have shared with us. So thank you if you've already done that, and we'd love to hear from you uh, if you haven't taken it yet. So let's get into character options. Last uh, week, I think we talked about druids, and now we are going to talk about monks. I think it was fighters. That's You're how, right. Uh, You're right. I blocked out fighters for some reason out of my memory. Uh, but now we're going to talk about monks and we're going to start with the optional features that Tasha's presents. You want to kick us off with the level two option? We'll, we'll alternate. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So dedicated weapon. Whenever you finish a short or long rest, you can touch one weapon, focus your key on it, but it doesn't cost key and count that weapon as a monk weapon until you use this feature again. The weapon has some, some prerequisites. It must be simple or martial. So martial is an expansion because normally you have a short sword and simple weapons. Right. Uh, now you must also be proficient with it. And that's where you might have to turn on your brain if it's early in the morning, because what this seems to most do is allow you to count as a monk weapon, something that you gained a use of that is simple or martial through a multi-class or a racial benefit mm -hmm. or a feat or something like that. Yeah. That's what, when I read oh, that too. Yeah. Go ahead. We have to say it has to lack the heavy and special properties, which takes away any two handed. You can't be, you know, decks wielding a great sword or anything right. like that. Right. So yeah, the, I read that and I said, must be proficient with it. And then I had to run back to D and D beyond and say, wait yeah. a second, how do you get proficient as a monk? with everything other than simple and short swords and i guess that is what the it must be for um for multi-classing and uh for you know racial benefits like uh dwarves yeah i i have a lot of opinions on the monk class i've played it was my first character i made for 5e was a monk and it remain, remains one of my mid-level characters rather than reaching the heights like others have and it's not that it isn't fun it's a barrel of fun all the movement and the options and things but i feel like at the core it's complicated in ways that aren't necessary for balance and and this is an expression of it right because mm -hmm. It's like you have so many features that only work with an unarmed strike, but then you can attack with your weapon and do things still. And, and so what is your weapon? And it's very limited. So this expands it a bit. I, I, you know, I don't know. It, it, yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, the whole question of is an unarmed strike a weapon? And it, it is it is complicated and goes beyond what it needs to be fun and cool the the heart of the the class uh, at level three you get key fueled attack if you spend one key point or more as part of your action on your turn you can make one attack with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon as a bonus action before the end of the turn so what this is trying to do is fix the problem of a monk having to give up an attack to do another cool thing with their action and key points uh, so I see that that's good. Yep, that's good. But is yeah. that enough to make it? I, I don't know that it's enough, but it is a good boost, right? So like the monk of uh, the four, the path of the four, uh, the tradition, the four elements tradition, yeah. you know, they use a lot of key points to cast a spell that's maybe not that powerful, but at least now they can also punch somebody once. Right. It's a little better, you know? Yeah. yeah. So you could, uh, you know, you could spend that key point to, to have the dodge action and and then attack to you know think little things like that or if you use yeah. it to increase your speed you get an attack during it it's it's okay yep. trying to trying to give the monk a little bit of a boost there yeah 
And what I would say is, you know, in terms of we see some of these optional class features are very like you could take it or leave it. I think the monk is a class that needs these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, this is a good one to allow in your campaign. Yep. Give that flexibility and a little more power. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do the level four? Oh, do I? <laughs> <laughs> do level you? four, quickened healing. As an action, you can spend two key points and you roll a martial arts die. You're, that's your damage die that comes off the main monk table. You regain a number of hit points equal to the number rolled plus your proficiency bonus. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty good. Um, and monks have always had across the editions this idea of sort of being a self heal you do have a self heal that's part of your your package and this kind of does a a bigger boost to that right um what's weird is how it works across levels mm -hmm. when you're in a battle at low level you know or even mid level mid ish i'm fifth level i have five key points am i going to spend two of them to heal 1d6 plus 3 hit points as an action i don't know you know that's kind of expensive. I do get to punch someone when I'm doing it, which is good because of the previous feature. Right. And that's why the previous feature is there. <laughs> yeah. But then at yeah. high levels, two key is nothing or not much at all. I'm 17th level. I have 17 key points. I can easily spend two to heal 1d10 plus six. Uh, the other thing that you'll really see is that key points come back when you take a short rest or a long mm -hmm. rest. But if you know you're going to get a short rest, you can heal up with all the extra key points you have. And, and maybe that alone was sort of the main impetus for this, you know, sort of to reset your body and dig deep. And then that might be good. I mean, it compares somewhat favorably to second wind, you know, so it, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's always this thing of the spending of the key points. That's a little tight for most monks. True. True. Uh, at level five, you get focused aim. When you miss with an attack roll, you can spend one to three key points to increase your attack roll by two for each of the key points you spend, potentially turning the miss into a hit. Uh, so what I would say first is this should include a rider that says an attack roll with an unarmed strike or monk weapon, because otherwise you're multi-classing and, uh, you know, yeah. casting whatever big spell you have as a wizard. Oh, I missed with my, or a cleric, right? I missed with my, uh, what's a big flame strike or yeah I don't know. yeah the what's the rate uh, the one that does radiant damage at first level that's I mean, 40 guiding bolt guiding bolt right you yeah. do guiding bolt that's your big oh wait i missed i'm going to uh so you know inflict wounds yeah right mm -hmm. it's just just one of those things that if it's focused aim because you're a monk then you're probably doing it with monk weapons uh, and then you know you get to multi-classing with where you have the power attack feet or the sharpshooter feet and oh, I, I'm minus five to get the plus ten. Well, now I can just throw some key points at it, yeah. and I I will have a less chance of missing. So, you know, I, I think it's a cool use of key points, uh, yeah. but it's you know it's just one of those things where because it's a monk, there's always these extra riders that that either should sure. go along with it or have to go along with it. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, yep. I think it's generally I'm pretty for it. I, I think that while yep. you can multi-class, the cost is fairly high to do that for just this feature. So I think it's generally good. And I like the concept that a monk can dig deep and be like, no, I'm 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 doing this, right? I'm hitting the big bad. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and with the monk, it's all about hitting several times rather than hitting one big time. Right. So uh so it's not as huge a thing. Yeah, it's it's important to get those hits yeah. in. Yeah, I, I think you're right in the sense that these feel like they're trying to fix the monk, uh, where it's hard to fix any class with just adding more stuff, especially with a class that has a lot of stuff to start with. Yeah. Though, again, as, as we've seen in some of these others, and I think we'll see with the ranger a little bit as well, it's interesting that they, they aren't addressing problems head on mm -hmm. more kind of going sideways to them and what i mean by that is if i think of the monk you know one of the things i think about is it's really hard to make magic items work for you mm -hmm. and yet you have a feature and this is true of so many editions the monk gets the ability to treat their hands as, as an as a magic weapon but they do so way late in the game yep. usually way after other characters have a magic weapon in their hands yeah well, shouldn't it be opposite? Shouldn't it be earlier? Like, yeah. I would have liked an optional feature to see the monk treat their hands as magic weapons way earlier. Like, who cares? Yeah. Make them magical. Like, yeah, that should be the fun thing you do versus right. 
being nerfed because you don't carry a magic weapon and kind of can't work effectively with one, right? So yeah. anyway. No, I, I agree. Let's uh, get into the first monk subclass today, which is the Way of Mercy. Uh, conceptually, it is someone who can manipulate the life force, force of others to bring aid to those in need. At level three, you get Implements of Mercy. Uh, you gain proficiency in the insight and medicine skills, and you gain proficiency with an herbalism kit. And yeah, oh, well, good. Yeah. The kit part's interesting. That's yep. And you then, and also, and I was like, okay, here's the big thing. I'm <laughs> waiting for the big thing here. It says you also gain a special mask, which you often wear when using the features of this subclass. And there's, you can determine its appearance, but they have a random generation for what it looks like. And I was just like, what could be, you know, and you know, the, the picture they put in was like the uh, plague mask, the, the, the plague yeah. doctor mask. And, and the, the only thing I could think of was I'm, I'm a commoner on the street and I'm hurting <laughs> and this thing comes running to me with this weird looking mask on. I'm just screaming in pain. I'm terrified. I'm running. Yeah, yeah, that was, it's, it's it, weird. The, the other thing is that we never feed off of the mask again. Right. Yeah, it's literally just this. You've got a mask. You don't have to wear it. Right. But you, you, you know. Well, I guess a lot of monks who are monks from the way of mercy, they do that. It's like, okay, all right. Yeah, hmm. I, I was too. I was waiting for okay in a later, you know, yeah. feature. It might say the mask as the meant. Nope, it's just. Nope. You just wear it. Well, you know, wear your mask, folks. Apparently, indeed. And you know, I think maybe this is just one of those like, if you uh, if you're a designer, sometimes you express things that are on your mind, and this just feels yeah. like um, it's either how you need to express yourself, you know, just to have this mask be a part of your character. Here you go. Yep. yep. Also, at level three, you get hand of healing. Uh, your touch can mend wounds as an action. You can spend one key point to touch a creature and restore a number of hit points equal to a roll of your martial martial arts die plus your wisdom modifier. And when you use flurry of blows, you can replace one of the unarmed strikes with a use of this feature. So you can hit, 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 and then heal somebody uh, with one of your blows. And I, so I, I, I love this. And as I really sat and thought about the class, I, I really like this subclass concept of being able to heal or hurt as part of what it kind of already does as being a monk. What's tough here is we get into this whole piece about how a monk is designed as a core class and how this wording works, which I think is complex mm -hmm. um, because we just finished reading about the optional abilities that tell us about how we can heal ourselves. But this is it, this class, and we'll see this with the next subclass too. It's like it deliberately is made to not use those rules. Right. Um, so, you know, flurry is a bonus action and you can't do two bonus actions in a turn. So you can't flurry to, replace one of your, if you flurry to replace one of your attacks with a healing hand of healing, you can't also do a key fueled attack because that is a bonus action. And that's not immediately obvious. Um, and I think that in play, new players will be tripped up by sort of what seems like very similar compatible things, but aren't actually. Right. So I can heal someone else without using the key point, but to heal myself, I would use it. Yeah, you're right. It's you can do quickened healing as an action and then a bonus for a single unarmed, which is normal kind of monk stuff. Right. Or you can do an action key point to flurry as a bonus. One attack is used for healing mm -hmm. using this subclass. Right. Uh, or as an action, you spend a key point for hand of healing, bonus action and key point to flurry. <laughs> you know, so it's, it, it's good to take some work, I think, for for players and DMs to wrap their arm, their minds around this, which is, you know, one of the things that maybe I wish it were a little simpler, right? But yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, also at level three, because we're not done with level three yet, you no. get hand of harm. Uh, when you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend one key point to deal extra necrotic damage equal to one roll of your martial art die plus your wisdom modifier. You can use this feature once per turn. 
seems pretty good. Um, yeah. It's a decent damage spike. You know, first it's just D4 plus your wisdom, but at low levels, that's not bad. And later you've got, you know, D10s and things like that. So it can work with OAs. Yeah, pretty neat. Yep. Uh, at level six, you get Physician's Touch. When you use the Hand of Healing on a creature, you can also end one disease or one of the following conditions, blinded, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, or stunned. Wow. When you use Hand of Harm on a creature, you can subject that creature to the poison condition until the end of your next turn. Uh, the first ability there is pretty good for sixth level. I mean, you're you're removing poison, paralyzation, blindness, deafness, stunned. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty good. Yeah, that is really sweet, and because you can also be flurrying, that gives you a lot of capability for how you do it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's pretty neat. Um, yeah. Yep. And and the flurry part is without spending a key point for the healing. Right. So right. due to the earlier ability. So that's like free removal of these conditions. Oh, that's that's impressive. Yeah. And, it, and then the ability to poison a creature is nothing to sniff at either because there's no mm -hmm. save here and you're giving them disadvantage uh, for the condition until the end of your next turn. That's pretty neat. Yep. That is at level 11, you get flurry of healing and harm. So when you use flurry of blows, you can now replace each of the unarmed strikes with uh, your hand of healing without spending a key point. So now you're healing multiple people and also removing conditions. Um, in addition, when you make an unarmed strike with a flurry of blows, you can use hand of harm with that strike without spending the key point for hand of harm. So now you're just yeah. doing the extra damage without spending the key point still only once per turn yeah but this is pretty neat i mean that's um you know your key has to be spent to fuel the flurry but um but this is this is pretty cool it's it certainly this makes this subclass very competitive with the ever popular you know stunning creatures um and and i think this is to me more interesting so i now when i'm thinking monk i'm thinking this is pretty cool yeah. just at a level 11 i think this is and, and even the early levels i'm thinking this is really attractive yep and then at level 17, you get Hand of Ultimate Mercy. As an action, you can touch the corpse of a living creature that died within the past 24 hours and expend five key points. The creature then returns to life, regaining a number uh, of hit points equal to 40, 10 plus your wisdom modifier. If the creature died while subjected to any of the following conditions, it revives uh, them with the conditions removed. And it's those same blinded, deaf, and paralyzed, poisoned, and stunned. Uh, you can only use this feature once per long rest. Uh, obviously, this is quite powerful. It's level 17, so I, I get it. Uh, but even if you cast True Resurrection, uh, or Resurrection, I mean, they come back with exhaustion and all these penalties. Right. Here, they don't. They're, they come back, they're completely fine, and they've and got a boost heal. A, yeah, boosted heal. So, yeah, it, it's really neat. I mean, Level 17, the, the only downside of this is that you're not getting some you know, damage dealing feature or some strong always on thing that some subclasses have. But, uh, but boy, when you need this, this is going to certainly shine and it certainly fits the theme. So I, I like this. This is a cool subclass. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, and next time we'll talk about the way of the astral self, which is another monk subclass, but that one's pretty long too. So we're going to need a little extra time to give that one the love it deserves. And we want to get into talking about the final chapter of Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden, chapter seven, Doom of Yithrin. So, yes. So let the cold Arctic winds of the spoilers blow you away if you are uh, not wanting to be spoiled on uh, chapter seven. Yeah, and this is a, about as spoily as it could get. This this is the, the last chapter of the adventure, so you couldn't get more spoiled than how it ends. <laughs> this is true, although you may come to find out that <laughs> how it ends really it doesn't matter for chapter seven. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So mm -hmm. let's give let's give the super quick recap. Hey, you are in the Ten Towns at the start of the adventure, doing quests around Icewind Dale, stopping the Durgar and their Shardland dragon from destroying uh, all ten of the Ten Towns. And you're <laughs> confronting Oriel on her island. And maybe you killed her, but probably not. Uh, so maybe you put the rhyme on hold by killing her rock 
or maybe not. Maybe you stole her book or codicil. Well, you probably did if you got here because you need it to get into right. the glacier. And you probably used the rhyme a poem to open the passage through the haunted caves of hunger into the lost and crashed nethery city of Yithrin, buried within the glacier. Whew. So yeah. it's been an adventure. We've uh, we've done a lot. And maybe we start with kind of the, the next part, which is the running this chapter piece, because it's got some sort of technical things that we are given. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're told to read four sections before running this chapter. I do like that they tell you, don't run this cold. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is you actually could get away with running a little bit of it cold, but there, is, there are some moving parts that uh, you have to take into account. We'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get into those. Um, so that's why they're directed, why you're told this, yeah. that you better read those sections. Um, Level-wise, you should be ninth level. And we are told about leveling. This is again, as we've seen in this adventure, more than any 5e product before. They're, we're not using milestones. We're not using XP. This is straight judgment call. And it says that, you know, you decide when the PCs level. But oh, hey, here are some suggestions. Gain a level after overcoming all of the eight towers of magic. Gain a level when you reach Eriolarthus's study. Gain a level if you do something extraordinary, such as destroying Eriolarthus, all three forms of Aural or the Obelisk. Um, so you could reach as high as 12th level is their suggestion. And it really doesn't matter because this is the last thing in the book. Right. So depending on what level you, the DM, want the characters to be, you could just get, get them to level 10 or get them all the way up to level 12 or higher, um, depending on what you're feeling. And, you know, unlike an adventure, like I feel like this adventure in many ways feels like Tomb of Annihilation, but different. Uh, I just, I'm always seeing parallels to it. And maybe that's just me. Um, but in Tomb, not only do you have a big showdown you're heading towards, but the, the levels are getting harder the deeper you go. Right. And so what level you are, if you want that challenge, if you want that death trap feel that, you know, these monsters that spring to life and animate are going to be rough, you need to be particular levels for that to work. Mm -hmm. Here, the fights that I'm seeing in this chapter are not particularly brutal. Mm -hmm. And so it's not particularly critical and they don't rely on that. It's more about the story of them. So it's not critical that you be a particular level you know, or not be too high a level. So you can, I think, feel free to award levels is the way I'd look at it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is interesting that, first of all, I want to, I have seen a lot of confusion online and in person about what milestone means. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just as an aside, yeah. uh, you know, you can give XP based on the monsters that they kill because each monster has an XP value. That's just normal XP, monster XP uh, advancement. Milestone advancement. Some people read that as at a certain place in the plot, you level. That's not milestone leveling. What milestone leveling means is when you complete a certain milestone, you get a certain amount of XP for that. And that it generally will put you to a point where you gain the next level, but not always. Right. So if someone's talking about milestone XP, you have to read a little deeper and see if they're talking more about plot based leveling, which is what, what this book does. This book is you are at this point in the story, this point in the plot, it's time to level. I see um, what you're saying. So you, you could, you could make the argument that it is saying these are milestones, but, but sort of you make the call of what the milestone is. Here are right. some suggestions for what yeah. the milestones stones are. Right. Yeah, for yeah, for yeah, I can see that. as it's as it's described, I think in the Dungeon Masters Guide, milestone mm -hmm. experience, you know, milestone advancement is don't keep track of monsters, just keep track of these particular points and give XP when they reach this point, right. not give a level when they reach this point, and that's the that's the key difference. Um, yeah, because not many people I know actually use milestone XP. Uh, milestone advancement because if you're going to give it based on where you are in the plot you may as well just do it by levels rather than experience points that's true yeah so milestone usually is xp based it's it's right it is xp based per the rules it's not level yeah. granting right there is level advancing without xp in the dmg 
Yeah. Which is the next section. Yeah. And, and so, yes, in some ways, this is this is a sort of interesting combination in that they have what one could consider milestones, but there's no XP behind them. Right. Yeah. yeah it's, it's more it's, level advancement. Yeah. But it's story that's based like story based advancement. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, Thanks. so with, oh, yeah. Uh, with previous chapters, Teos, this is Teos's note, but I agree. With previous chapters in this book, they did a really good job of setting up what's this chapter about? What are the characters trying to do here? Um, and even if there were a ton of quests, the chapter would tell you there are a ton of quests. And so do two or three of them and then move on to the next chapter. This chapter is different. <laughs> yeah. uh, this chapter sort of gives you some idea about what's going on in this area and what outside influences might come into the area, but there isn't anything necessarily happening. Yeah. It, and, and it's like, there's no, it's interesting because it's, it, it I, I keep struggling with it. it. I want to say there are no conclusions, but there kind of are. And there certainly are epilogues that tell you what happens based on what's going on, but there's no obvious drive to, you know, the chamber of a Sarak or, the big dragon or the main giant or anything like that that you're going to take on, even though there are various foes, one of which could be a real one of which can be this demulich that we'll talk about. Um, it's like we get ingredients, mm -hmm. but we're not really given the recipe and we don't get a true picture of the m intended meal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of. well, well, I mean, if you think about uh, the uh, tomb of annihilation, there is something horrible happening in the world and it's affecting the whole world and you are being driven to stop it. And the exact point and place that you can stop it is at the bottom of this tomb. And yeah. so there is a, if you don't do X, Y will continue on and people will continue to die. And you are even given NPCs that will die sooner or later if you don't fix the problem in this as we've talked about before what is the main problem it's it's the rhyme it's the everlasting darkness but no one's dying from it per se right people can actually leave they don't have to hang around if they don't want to <laughs> uh and they're while it's terrible it's not something that is world affecting uh, it's not right. something that is necessarily needs to be ended to save the universe. Well, and I would go back to the, the fact that we may have ended this several chapters ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. And so I'm still hurting for the reason why the PCs are here. Yeah. Which isn't clear. And I, and I wish the adventure had given us a few more options for why we might be here, because I, I think it can function as, as the sandboxy beast that it is. Right. Uh, but, but we need to think through, you know, you might be here because I, I tend to think my characters and my campaigns would probably gravitate towards, I'm not going to do what the arcane brotherhood is doing, but I know they're going to not stop until they get this. So I better go in and deal with it, whatever right. it might be. Yeah. Uh, and I think probably in my campaigns, Oriel would still be alive and we would know that, and I would probably change this if I were running it to that something in here must be stopped, mm -hmm. uh, which the Mythalar is the obvious answer. And so that would give us a plot, right? But as it is, we, it's almost like we don't know what the plot might be, mm -hmm. which is very unusual. And we're not told possible options, right? Again, we don't get possible. It's just sort of here are these bits and pieces. Yeah. It what I would do with this is take Oriel, you deal with her for the first time on her island. Uh, you encounter her, you maybe even kill her first form. Then she disappears and there is a clue that she went to this place mm -hmm. and you get a message from Waterdeep. It's snowing in Waterdeep in the middle of summer. <laughs> Uh, in the 10 towns, people start to ice over, right? Now you have a reason to go. 
an important yeah. reason to go. All the other things, the Arcane Brotherhood, the, the Netherese yeah. city, it's all cool. It's all great background. It's all mot- it's motivational, but it's not the sole motivation to go. Every character probably will want to stop this. Not every character is going to care what the Arcane Brotherhood does or care about this city that's been lost forever. Yeah, I like that. That's re- that's really good. That would be a powerful piece. And then it would give you uh that that f- that concluding feeling that you've that you've made a big imp- a big change cuz one of the things that's a little tough is I like conclusions to feel like you have made a truly epic difference. And mm-hmm. what's bizarre is you might do the chapter where you fight Oral and the rhyme possibly even unwittingly. Mm-hmm. And and, and without a sense of whether you truly stopped it or, or set it back a bit. Uh, and then you go to the city, you don't know why. And you might do things in the city as we're gonna find out that actually destroy the 10 towns. <laughs> so right. it's almost like the opposite. You might, uh, yeah, it's really yeah. fascinating. So, yeah. but, but let's let's talk about a few things that can happen because okay. I, I think what, what maybe if this chapter, what I think this chapter could have said a bit more remaining within its existing framework is to say that the following things may happen Mm -hmm. in this chapter. The characters will likely face the Demi Lich, Mm -hmm. uh, which we're going to talk about. The characters will will deal with any remaining NPCs who are adversarial. Mm -hmm. They either have to win them over and form an alliance or defeat them because they're going to come at them. The characters may try to turn back time. (laughs) Right. You might want to say that up front because it's it's worth knowing that there is a time travel piece here that is possible and it's a significant thing. Yeah. Uh, and it may leave your players feeling like when you watch one of those movies and you're like, that's how it ends. Okay. All right, then. Um, yeah. The characters may use the mythal art to change the weather, though, if I'm reading it correctly, someone has to stay there to constantly keep it going. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit of a thing. Uh, and the characters may last or least. Sean, take this one. The, when one of the subheadings that you're reading is summoning the Tarask, you know, it's things have gotten either, you know, very interesting or you are way, way, way over the shark. Uh, so, yeah, they may summon the Tarask, which if they do, will then just head off to destroy first the city that they're in and then onward to the 10 towns. So you could unleash the Tarask on the 10 towns at level nine. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And, and, and then it proceeds south. It's, I mean, you, you truly, you don't unleash the Tarask to handle Yithrin. Right. You unleash it upon the world and it tears through the sword coast and all sorts of things. And it's like, I, I read all this and I was like, I can't believe this is a possible conclusion, but it truly is. And I don't know that the players are given the information to do this. Like to me, this was very AD and D type design, right? Like yeah. it's just a thing that can happen right. and your characters will learn it after they see it versus you must, you know, I think more late third, fourth, fifth is the kind of idea of you're, you've got this tough decision to unleash the Tarask, knowing that it's going to do these bad things, but then you do this good thing. Is it, no, it's, you don't get that kind of math. You just right, yeah. You just get the scroll. <laughs> yeah, you just get this scroll that summons the Tarask, and and there it goes. Yeah. So that's that's, and and it's all. It can all be interesting things. <clears throat> it can all be interesting, but you want to and i've said this so many times before a cool narrative kind of loops back on itself and there are clues and there there's repetition and there's hints there was no hint about a tarask there was no hint about a demi lich there's no hint really about um uh, even a mythalar you know none of that was even remotely plausible or possible and it's all dumped on you you as the player and you as the dm <laughs> sort of at, at the last minute. And so it's it. There, all the pieces are there to tell a great story. You yeah. DM now have to figure out how to put those pieces together for your players. And we will try to help you out in that endeavor. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to go. And what I do love about this chapter, it's worth saying is this chapter is full of really neat experiences 
Mm -hmm. um, there's this is a place of wonder. It is both a modern design and also one that calls back funhouse type adventures. Uh, and it does it in a great way. It, it tells a fantastic story. This is memorable. You know, your players will remember having been to the city of Yithrin and, and there's a great story being told here, but you must add to it, as Sean said, the take on where this should go and what the pivot points are and how to impart that upon your players because the adventure doesn't really do that for you. And there are a fair number of moving pieces and how you use those. I think there it's, it's a little complicated. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, if Oril is still alive and if uh, Avarice is still alive, there's, they're coming into this sort of maelstrom of many options that could be going on. And they're separate from the description of the city itself. Uh, so you have to work in what their presence will mean. And, and there's, it's not completely left out. They do say, you know, if, if Oriel comes, this is where she is, but it changes the way things work in the city that you have to be aware of. And Sean, I'm wondering, you know, looking at the time here, do you want to maybe talk, should we talk through the fall of Yithrin and the Demolich and then kind of yeah. pause there? Sounds good. All right. I'll let Give you hit, hit right. that high point. So um, one of the main foes that we'll find here is Iriolarathus, the Demolich. Iriolarthus was once a powerful human Netherese wizard. He owned this place or, or you know, ruled over it. Um, and he, he became a lich, then he became a demi-lich. And we get some reinforcement here that honestly, I'd forgotten this piece, which is that a demi-lich, if it's unable to, or a lich, if it's unable to feed souls into its phylactery, uh, begins to fall apart and becomes a demi-lich. And sometimes this happens because they're kind of absent-mindedly focused on something, or in this case, because your city crashed and your phylactery is buried underneath. And for two year, 2,000 years, you weren't able to give it a soul. Mm -hmm. um, and so Iriolarthus, who was once this very calculating and powerful person, and of course, evil and other ease, uh, is now turned into this demulich, unaware of how much time has passed. And the main guidance we're given is that what the demulich will do is will uh, study the characters, sort of thinking that the characters may be Netherese rescuers who have come to rescue them because we don't know how long it has been if you're Yolarthus. Uh, so he's going to silently watch them from afar. And if you don't fool them, realizes they're interlopers and will become hostile. Unlike previous sections where we sort of get like, here's a good place for the for Yolarthus to show up or we'll attack once here and then move somewhere else. No, it's just simply you have Yolarthus' stats. You decide when to invoke Yolarthus. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to keep in mind, sadly, is that demi liches don't speak. They don't have language. So yeah. there's no way to get this story across to the players unless you find a way to do that. Yeah. Um, so then understanding the city, the Yithrin, um, was a flying netherese city that Iriel Arthas and his apprentices, a city full of mages, flew to the north seeking relics of Astoria. And this was a story that we get, you know, was reinforced strongly upon the DD community when Storm King's Thunder was released. Mm -hmm. Astoria is the ancient kingdom of the giants. It's 40,000 years ago that this thing was operational, back when one would fight with it was giants and dragons that were fighting over the world. Um, and so the the netherese city with Arialathus were searching this is a long time ago minus 343 dr um so this is you know before the gray box set yeah uh long they, ago <laughs> long long ago they're flying around this area before there wasn't a 10 towns and they find a stone spindle that looks sort of like a like a chunk of like a dagger of stone almost um, and it is bearing strange sigils. They find it under the sea of moving ice. They extract it and experiment it. It releases a bunch of power that causes the city, the, the Mithilar, to shut down and the whole city to plummet down and crash into the ragged glacier. 
it's worth knowing that there's we get a sort of sidebar that has some of this information, but I pulled a little more from the Forgotten Realms uh, wiki, the FR wiki, which is a great site. Mm -hmm. uh, a mythalar is different than a mythal. If you think of like myth Draenor, that has a mythal. That's like a ward type device. A mythalar is different. Mythalars are a netherese device, looks like a crystal ball, sheds bright light like a sun. <laughs> it can be up to 150 feet in diameter. Um, and these things are created in minus 3000 DR, so a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And around the year 2000, negative 2200 DR, the Netherese were lifting one flying city in the sky each year, right? So this is how crazy the Forgotten Realms has been. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And they managed to make them self-aware and more powerful. And then what happens is an event known as uh, Karsus's Folly. And we're told about this in this adventure. The wizard Karsus tries to steal Mistral's divinity. She's the goddess of magic. And Mistral sort of as a defense mechanism because magic would just go crazy and the world would be horrible. Think Spellblag, but worse. Or, or just Spellblag. Um, she shuts down magic, all magic, and sacrifices herself rather than give her divinity to Karsus. Mm -hmm. And Karsus and all these other netherese are in these flying cities. So what <laughs> happens when there's no magic? Yeah, crash. Crash. So that's Karsus's folly because when the magic was gone, uh, it crashes. Now, Mistral uh, reboots, I mean, uh, is reborn <laughs> as Mistra, which is why we get the later name. Mm -hmm. uh, and by, by, the, by that time, uh, all these cities have fallen. We also have that the Netherese are fighting against this creatures known as the Ferim. So almost all of these cities crash somewhere and are gone um like there's one in, in the neverwinter wood um there are a number around that, that are known um but one city went to the shadow fell and that's where all this nether shadow influence comes from mm -hmm. um and then of course we have this one trapped here with its still functioning mythalar mm -hmm. yeah so that uh is what happened to bring it here and that's and it why the characters may travel in time but that's a whole other <laughs> story whole thing <laughs> and just to quickly note that when yithrin's falling um the, the, all the mages are like oh crap what do we do mm -hmm. and Ir <laughs> Ilir larthas gates himself to a demi plane all right this is a good way to avoid falling damage so uh but the spindle impedes magic and it forces him out of that demi plane after it crashes um and some of the other mages managed to survive initially as well by doing other tricks like this. The demiplane becomes a living demiplane, which just sort of ends up being a creature, but it's a fun part of the story. Mm -hmm. And around 50 years after the crash, which is still a really long time ago, the survivors, anyone who had used some magic to avoid damage or been in some protected place, uh, they begin to descend into madness and fear from being locked in this icy cave and they become Nothics, which is very interesting. And we see some of them in this adventure. We already have seen some of them at the end of the Caves of Hunger uh, and see more as we go. Yeah. And then Irilarthus, as we say, he, he grows feeble because he can't reach his phylactery. And so he becomes a Demulich. Um, and that leaves this sort of haunted necropolis that has sort of constructs that the netheries have created. It has the Nothics, and then it has this Demulich, and then some other creatures who arrive in yeah. <laughs> previous parts of the story. Exactly. Not to mention the things that are already there, which we will cover next episode. So thank you so much for listening, everyone. We hope you are enjoying the show. Uh, if you aren't, let us know why. Uh, you can go to our website and, and uh, misdirectedmark.com and talk to us there or you know on Twitter or whatever. But if you want to become a patron, and thank you to our patrons, you can go to patreon.com slash MMP and give us uh, you know a buck a month just to uh, let us know that you're listening, that you're alive out there and safe and enjoying D&D like we are. Uh, hey, Teo, so uh, where can people find you on social media? I am at AlphaStream on Twitter. My blog is at AlphaStream.org, and I fully agree. It's, it's very helpful and kind to us when you are part of our Patreon. Thank you. 
Yep. And you can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin. You can go to the forums at forums.misdirectedmark.com to talk to Teos and I. Or you can follow the misdirected, uh, not misdirected Mark, you can follow the podcast Twitter, which is at Mastering DND. Mastering Dungeons is a misdirected Mark production, the media arm of encoded designs. So, Teos, what should we do now? Gonna go back in time. <laughs> <laughs> way, way back in time. <laughs> way back in time. Before Waterdeep and all. Good, good <laughs> I can't stuff. Wait to talk about that. It's good, good stuff. Good stuff.